I think we're going to just plan to have time, uh, make time, I guess, if we have to, to also cover uh, the book of Jude because there's some uh, similarity uh, between Second Peter and Jude. And so you need to study those together, if nothing else, but for the fact that some folks even will try to, say, to discredit Jude and or uh, Jude or Second Peter on the basis of the similarities between the two. They'll say, well, you know, uh, in fact, there was some debate in the uh, early church as to, well, is, is Second Peter, does that belong in the canon of the New Testament? Uh, I've been talking about this with our high school class downstairs, and some of the folks would, would ask that question. Does, does Second Peter belong? I mean, it's got some, some similar material to uh, Jude. Uh, of course, some people ask the same question about Jude. Well, does Jude belong because it's so similar to Second Peter? And there's, there's nothing there to discredit either. And, of course, we, we know from, uh, as, as Lightfoot said, and you may remember this from our How We Got the Bible Study, the, the canon of the Bible was, especially the New Testament, was questioned, it was debated, uh, and we're better off for it because now we know with even more certainty that the books that we have are, they do belong in the Bible, not because some council voted on it or somebody decreed that they belong, but because they are authoritative, inspired of God. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about some of that when we get to Second Peter and Jude. But this morning we are looking at the book of First Peter. Uh, you know, I was telling Johnny yesterday, we were talking, and I, I've, I've never, I don't, I, at least I can't recall that I've ever taught First Peter or Second Peter or Jude for that matter. <laughs> Uh, as far as sitting in a class in a formal setting and, and teaching these books. And so I've been uh, going over a lot of different things. In fact, I, I just, uh, I even uh, happen to think that we've, I'll say this again, uh, Bremen has one of the best libraries I've seen in a congregation. I've, I've worked with a few different congregations, not just a ton, but uh, been to several others. Uh, our library is top notch. And so I even, I didn't think about that until later on, but I thought, well, I'm going to go check out our library, and, and I finally had to just kind of cut myself off. <laughs> okay, I can't take everything out of here that pertains to the book of First Peter. But there's a, this is one of those books that it's, it's straightforward. Uh, you know, it's not like some books where you can really uh, dig in. There's just, you could talk about it for days and weeks and months, and uh, some books even years. And yet, at the same time, the more you study this book, the more you realize that there is, there is a plainness about it, a simplicity about it, and yet there's depth uh, in the message as well. And, of course, we would expect that from a book that's inspired of God. Uh, that's, that's the nature of any book of the Bible, but you especially realize that when you, when you read First Peter in a daily Bible reading or something like that, you say, okay, you know, it, it, it means what it says and says what it means, and, and that's, it's pretty straightforward. But, like I said, when you start, start getting into the book, you realize there's, there's a lot more to it than first meets the eye. It's hard to talk about this book without, and I don't want to spend too much time on it uh, because really that could almost be a whole other class. But it's hard to talk about the book of First Peter without at least to, in, some, in some regards talking about the author, the human author. We understand the ultimate author is God, the Holy Spirit. But let's talk a little bit about Peter. Uh, Peter is somebody that I think everybody every Christian can relate to. Why do we say that? He was impulsive. He would say and do things that normally you wouldn't associate with a Christian. Right. Sometimes Peter would, would do things or say things and we, we kind of go, what, what's he doing? Why, why did he do that? And, and uh, sometimes, you know, it just kind of leaves us. But at the same time, I think a lot of times we look at Peter or, or see what Peter's doing read about that, and, and we say, you know, I, I do that same thing sometimes. I make that mistake. Uh, I, I sometimes have trouble engaging the brain before I speak or do something. Uh, my dad used to get on to me for that all the time, and ironically, I find myself getting on to some of my children for that all the time. You know, you got to learn to think before you do something. Uh, and, and even as adults, we sometimes struggle with that. And so I think that in that sense, a lot of us can relate to Peter. Sometimes, and I don't mean this as a detriment because it certainly is not, but sometimes I read about Paul and I think, I wish I were more like that man, but maybe I, I struggle to be what Paul is. You know, you almost felt like uh, 
we know Paul was not sinless, but you sometimes feel like when you're reading about him and he's just this tireless soldier for the Lord and you sometimes think, well, I wish I had that energy. I wish I had that, uh, that you know, seemingly unwavering devotion, knowing again that Paul did make mistakes in his life just because he was human, if nothing else. But you sometimes almost feel like here's, here's a standard that is just so far up there. And yet Peter, you look at and you feel like, you, you feel like, He's one of us, so to speak. Now, again, I say all that with the understanding that Paul's one of us also. Paul's not superhuman, and I, I, we talked about Abraham not too long ago in a Sunday morning sermon. I'm always quick to point out whenever talking about Bible characters that they, they are one of us. You know, they are people, and, and we can be an Abraham. We can be a Daniel. We can be a Paul. But also understanding that I can only speak for Chad, but I fall short many times, and I feel like when I read about Peter and I see Peter fall short, and, and, and he doesn't stay down, so to speak, he gets up, and he keeps, he keeps on persevering. Uh, I take heart in that, and I think a lot of people do, and I think that's why Peter's one of those really interesting Bible characters. He, of course, was uh, seemingly, seemed to have been a follower of John the Immerser, John the Baptist, that we sometimes call him. Uh, before he was a follower of Jesus, which of course makes sense, John being that herald for Jesus. But a uh, follower of John, it would seem from the, from the first chapter of John, because remember Andrew, uh, who was a follower of John, he brings his brother Peter. So we, we would, you know, it's, we don't have a book, chapter, and verse for it, but it would seem at least that Peter would have, was, along with Andrew, a follower of John the Baptist. Then um, he later on becomes a follower of Jesus, later on becomes an apostle of Jesus. He, of course, was uh, part of what we sometimes call the inner circle, Peter, James, John, the raising of Jairus' daughter, the transfiguration, and the agony that Jesus endured in Gethsemane. Uh, those three events witnessed only by those three apostles, James, John, and Peter. It's interesting. We, we, we understand that there is no, um, there's no attempt by Jesus or, or any of the Bible writers to elevate Peter to head apostle or anything as the Roman Catholic Church sometimes, uh, well, well, they do say that, uh, but there's no evidence in the Bible of him, his being elevated. And yet, we also understand, though, that I think, you know, I, I say this a lot, people tend to go to one extreme or the other. The one extreme says, you know, Peter was the head apostle and he was the head of the church and there's got to be this apostolic succession. Uh, and that certainly is a, an extreme that is wrong. But the other extreme that sometimes people try to go to is just, you know, almost to try to make him the least of the apostles. And I don't think there was any apostle that we would say was the least or the greatest. You know, Paul referred to himself once as the least of the apostles, but he was using that in the sense of he felt like the least of the apostles because he persecuted the church there in 1 Corinthians 15. But Peter, in every list of the apostles, in every single gospel account, is, is listed first. I don't, I'm not saying there's any real significance to that, except that it just tells us something about God's plan for this man. He wanted to use him in a special way. You see, Brother Scott mentioned his impetuousness. Um, I think you mentioned fiery, uh, something to that effect. But, but Peter was. He was kind of, a, for lack of a better term, a fireball. And, and that sometimes got him in trouble, but you know what? That was sometimes a good thing, wasn't it? He was a tremendous leader. In fact, before we get to 1 Peter, turn over to Acts chapter 2 and notice something. Look at uh, Acts chapter 2. Of course, there's the, the, the Spirit comes there on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, verse 1. They were all with one accord in one place. And, of course, that's important to tie back into the end of chapter 1 because sometimes, in fact, I, I get, Reagan and I get frustrated because we, we buy these books that are intended to be uh, children's books that you can kind of do when you have small children for a Bible time or a devotional time in your family at home. And uh, it seems like so many of them, uh, they're right down the line, and then you get to Acts chapter 2, and it has the Holy Spirit falling on every single person in the audience. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. Uh, just simple use of pronouns, following them back to their antecedent, tells us that. 
uh, the Holy Spirit came on the apostles, not the crowd. Uh, the apostles were immersed in the Spirit. And so uh, they, they've got the cloven tongues like as a fire, verse 3. Uh, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues. Uh, so then it goes through the nations, the people there that hear them speaking in their own tongue. But look at verse 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I have said this before and, and I've, I've since changed my mind on it. And studying the introdu introducing first Peter has strengthened my changing of the mind. But I have said before that... Uh, you know, sometimes people will say, Peter preached the first gospel sermon. I say, well, it wasn't Peter. It was Peter and, and the other disciples or the other apostles as well. Uh, I, I don't doubt that they may have preached at some point, but it's clear from Acts chapter 2, beginning there at verse 14, that Peter's preaching. Now, he stands up with the 11. God, again, God is not elevating him, and I'm not trying to go to that extreme. God's not saying, hey, here's the head apostle, and that's why he's preaching the first sermon. That's, that's an extreme, and that's wrong. But I'm also not saying something that the Bible doesn't say, which is that they're all preaching, and that would be kind of counterproductive anyways, if, if, you know, if everybody's standing up just talking at once. How, how would that uh, be understandable? It would just be kind of a bunch of noise. But Peter, God chose Peter to stand up on the day of Pentecost when the gospel is preached, and I, and I think there's a connection there with Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He used the keys to open the door to the kingdom, the church. And he did that by preaching the first gospel sermon by inspiration. But you see, here's a man who, yes, he sometimes is impetuous, uh, but he, he's got this, this fiery personality sometimes, but he's a great leader of men. He is a tremendous leader. In fact, later on, after Jesus is risen from the dead, Peter says, I go a fishing. I'm going fishing. What do the other disciples say? We're going with you. And so you see, you know, we talked Wednesday night about influence, but you also see his leadership. Here, here's a man, he was a take charge kind of person. And sometimes that got him into trouble, but a lot of times that helped him be a great, great servant of God. Yes, sir? You know, I believe that God spoke on the matter that you're speaking on right here because as he would relate to the church, the apostles would be under the same concept. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he uses... Uh, a, a body, if you will, the eye, the hand, and the feet, to make a point that, listen, everyone has their own role. And just because you're not one of these particular items does not mean that you're not important. Right. I'm sure that these apostles had various characteristics about themselves. And it would be insane to think that every one of them were pro prolific speakers. And I don't think that, that, that you find that with any group that is, is just brought together from all different sectors. So I think that's right. It is probably more than, than likely that, that, number one, he he had that characteristic. You meet people that are good speakers. I, I'm thankful we've got Chris Stevenson to make announcements as well as he does, not to throw off on anybody else's head. He is just very good at this. And that's, that's a good point. You know, the different apostles had different abilities. Uh, Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, I didn't come, you with, come to you with excellency of speech. So apparently Paul, now maybe that was just his meekness, but, you know, there's a, there's a good chance at least that this man was not. In fact, he even says in 2 Corinthians, you know, they say that he's rude in speech, you know, and that not, not rude like we would consider mean, but just elementary. You know, he's not a good speaker. And so there's a very good chance that Paul was not a good public speaker. But look at the personal work he did. Uh, whereas Peter apparently was a great public speaker, a great preacher, a great orator, we might say. And, and that's, you know, that's the way it is today. There are different, different talents in the kingdom of God. You have people who can get up and, and speak, and then you have people that would say, you know, I, I, I am terrified. I would, just, uh, I would rather do anything than get up and try to deliver a, a sermon or, or something in front of people. But man, they can do things behind the scenes and just, you know, sometimes we don't even know about it until, you know, maybe they've died and gone or, or something's happened, they're sick and they can't do it anymore. And you just go, why isn't this getting done? Well, that was brother or sister so-and-so. And, and it really is. It's amazing. That's a good point. I think that's true among the apostles. Yes, sir, Scott. Yes. In 
Yeah, there's there's no doubt, and, and all that's good good points to think about with the apostles. They were they were different people, and that's one of the things that shows uh, inspiration, shows the uh, how amazing Jesus here in God in the flesh was because he took this ragtag group of guys and and you know unifies them. And even though they weren't perfect, they were human. Obviously, they weren't perfect, but especially after the resurrection. Look at them go out and work as one. Uh, I mean, even on one occasion when Paul has to rebuke Peter, in Galatians chapter 2, the, is, that's recorded, he has to rebuke Peter, and, and even then, later on in Second Peter's, we'll see when we get there, Peter talks about Paul's writings of Scripture. He doesn't say, you know, that, that jerk, he thought he was better than me. He, he realized he was in the wrong. But, but these, these men that were so diverse, you know, the, that's a good point. Paul, here's Paul, he's a, kind of a privileged uh, person. Not that he was uh, ever spoiled, never get any indication of that, but he, he just came from a different background, more wealth. Peter, uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John, fishermen, you know, uh, as, as was mentioned, uh, might even be, you know, say well, they weren't even what you call blue collar, they were kind of below that, just very, very strenuous work. And of course you got Matthew who's probably from uh, not necessarily grew up wealthy, but he certainly would have been wealthy at the time because publicans were always wealthy. Uh, so, you know, a lot of different, and you got, of course, the zealot, uh, and, and zealots hated anything. Uh, and, and, of course, one of the things, one of the types of people that the zealots hated the most was who? The, the publicans, right? They couldn't stand them because those were the tax collectors for the hated Roman government. And yet, you have, uh, I just went blank. Who is the zealot? Somebody have to look that up for me. Uh, huh? Simon the zealot. Thank you. I just went blank on the zealot. I was thinking Thomas, and I knew that wasn't right. Uh, but Simon and Matthew, no indication that they ever clash. So they understand they're doing the work of the Lord that gets outside of, you know, we sometimes... Uh, tease each other about sports and things like that, but I think hopefully uh, we all understand that there's a cause that is so much bigger than that. I've, I have seen brethren get upset at one another, ribbing each other about sports and somebody takes it too far or uh, somebody takes it too seriously and now they're upset at each other. And that just blows my mind because there's something so much bigger than that, uh, that and that is serving God. And so these men put all that aside and they served God. And uh, Peter was a, was a great leader man, apparently appears to have been a, a good public speaker. And so he delivered that first sermon on the day of Pentecost. Now, again, he stood up with the other 11. I'm not trying to elevate Peter, but at the same time, we shouldn't be afraid to say what the Bible says about Peter. And that is that he was certainly a great leader of, of men and a great speaker. Um, some occasions when, when Peter spoke out, I'll just mention these, we won't go read all of them for time's sake, but you, you see the impetuous nature of Peter several times. Uh, John chapter 6, the disciples are, are leaving Jesus, we might say by droves. I, I don't know that, that that might be exaggerating, but the Bible doesn't really say it, but there are definitely some people who are leaving Jesus. He's, he's given what um, some of them describe as a hard saying. He's talked about uh, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, and they, they're just, you know, they're taking this literally, and this happens a lot in the book of John, by the way. Jesus will state a spiritual principle, and, and the people, whoever he's talking to, whether an individual or a group, they say, you know, they take it literally, and, and they're confused by it. You know, he says to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. What does Nicodemus say? What? How, how's a man enter into his mother's womb and be born again? I, I sometimes think if I had been Jesus right there, I might have said, seriously, are you really going to ask me that? Do you think I'm talking literally? But he should have known, and Jesus even says, that, you know, are you a master in Israel and you don't know this? You don't know these things? But that was an occasion, the, the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, and he says, you know, you, you can have living water and you won't thirst again. And she says, give me this water. I don't want to come here and draw water anymore. How about some of that living water you're talking about? And, of course, he goes on to explain it's a spiritual thing. But uh, that's, that's the case in John chapter 6. He's talking about eating his flesh, drinking his blood. And not even, sometimes people make that a reference to the Lord's Supper, but it's not. Uh, in its context, what it is, Jesus is just saying, you have to imbibe all of me. That's what Jesus says. It's not a la carte teaching. It's not take what you want, leave what you don't want. It's part and parcel, as we sometimes say. It's a package deal. 
as Brother Brinkley would say in that sermon of his that he's got. Jesus says, you, you are not going to take some and leave some. Take me as I am, Jesus says, and that's, that's the only way to heaven. But if you reject that, there are consequences. And so the people say, well, you eating his flesh, drinking his blood. What, what is he a cannibal or something? And, and so people start walking away. Well, some of, the, some of the disciples are leaving, and so Jesus turns to the 12 and says what? Will you also go away? And guess who sort of stems the tide of this exodus of Jesus' followers? It's Peter, right? Because what does Peter say? Peter's the one who speaks up. Verse 68 of John chapter 6. What does he say? Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And he goes on and says, And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ. He says, you can almost see Peter turn around to these people that are walking away and says, Hey, where are we going to go? Where are you guys going? Where else are you going to go for eternal life? And so at that point... Seems that departure stopped. Well, that's Peter speaking out. So that's an occasion where he did so in a good way. Um, Matthew chapter 16. Whom do men say that I am? Well, some people say you're John the Baptist or uh, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And whom say ye that I am? Who speaks up? Peter. And he says what? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and you know, again, the Catholics would try to make that Jesus saying here that Peter's going to be the foundation of the church, but it's clear when you study that text that what Jesus says is on the foundation of your confession that I am the Christ, on the foundation of his truth, the truth that he is the Christ, he says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Well, that's Peter speaking up. Of course, right in that same context, what does Jesus go on to tell him? He goes on to tell him how he's going to go into Jerusalem, he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be killed, and the third day rise again. And what does Peter say? He says, no. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but Peter basically says, not on my watch. You're not going to be betrayed. You're not going to be killed. I'm, I'm standing right beside you. We won't let that happen. And, of course, what's Jesus' very blunt response to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. To hinder Jesus' mission. Now, premillennialism can't answer that, by the way, because premillennialism says he came to establish a kingdom on earth and was thwarted and, and then decided to establish the church. Jesus says, though, his mission was to come and to die on the cross for our sins. And to stand in the way of that, to even try to talk him out of that, is to put oneself doing the work of the devil. So he wasn't trying to call Peter the devil. He was just saying, look, you're, you're doing his work if you try to keep me from this mission. You're not savoring the things of God. You're savoring the things of men. But again, that's an instance where Peter's speaking out. Um, uh, let's see, that's number two. Number three is uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. The tribute money. They're walking in and one of them says to Peter, what? Hey, does your master not pay tribute? What does Peter say? Well, of course he does. And, and it's interesting, it's not really, I don't know if you call it a rebuke, but what does Jesus say to Peter? You, you can almost see Jesus saying, uh, yeah, y'all know I like to think of I like to think of things a lot of times in modern day terms, and I'm I'm not trying to put words in the Bible where they're not there. But you, you can almost see Jesus saying, "Peter, come here. I want to talk to you off to the side here." And what does he ask Peter? Who pays Who pays taxes in a kingdom? Is it the citizens? Yeah, it's the citizens, Lord. Well, then are the children free, right? The children of the king, do they pay taxes? No. Oh, he's making a point to Peter. He is, Jesus is, the son of the king, God Almighty. And he says what? Nevertheless, lest we should offend them, since you've already promised that I'm going to pay that tax, <laughs> lest we should offend them, you go and you'll take up a fish and find a coin in his mouth. And he does. But again, that's Peter kind of speaking out. And Jesus takes him aside and says, hey, hang on here. But, but we don't want to offend him. And so there's that miracle of the coin in the fish's mouth. Uh, Matthew 26. Uh, well, Matthew... Um, yeah, let's, let's go to Matthew 14 first. In Matthew 14, 28, there's this uh, occasion where Jesus is walking on the water. And who speaks up? Peter, right? What does he say? If it's you, bid me to come to you on the water. And I've said this before, I think, here. 
Uh, I know I've said it in other places, but you know, do we, do we sometimes focus too much on Peter gets out there and he starts to sink? I mean, how many other apostles stepped out of the boat, folks? I think sometimes we're a little hard on Peter there. He's the only one that stepped out of the boat. He says, if, if a Jew bid me come to you, and Jesus says, come. So guess what he does? No indication that he thought twice. He stepped out onto the water. Now, once he got out of the water, maybe he took his eyes off Jesus or whatever, and he begins to look around. And, you know, and again, I'm not trying to justify that either. He, he took his eyes off Jesus, and you've probably heard sermons on that. And he, he began to look around and see the storms around. And a you know, great lesson in that for us on keeping our eyes and our focus on Jesus. But Peter's the one that stepped out of the boat. And I think that's, that says something for him. Uh, Matthew 26 is where I was about to go. Matthew 26, where... After the Lord's Supper, Jesus talking about being betrayed or being, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Not, well, he did talk about being betrayed, but that's not the word I'm looking for here. Forsaken by the disciples. They're going to leave him, and he's going to be all alone. And yet not alone because the Father's with him, and he says that. But Peter says what? Oh, that's not happening, Lord. I mean, everybody might leave you, but not me. I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. I, I will be with you to the death. To the death. And you don't need me to tell you what happened. He forsook Jesus, as they all did. He even was asked, hey, weren't you one of his companions? Oh, no, no, not me. I wasn't. No, no, I, th I saw you in the garden with him. No, you didn't. And, and, you know, and again, bring it down to modern day terms, you know, was, I swear it wasn't me. Yeah, I was not there. And then a third time. And he denies with cursing and swearing. And of course, what happens as he denies that third time? The rooster crowed, but what else? He locks eyes with Jesus. Later on in 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to read where Peter calls himself an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ. Uh, it, it almost feels silly, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in the introduction. Some people, some scholars, so-called, say Peter didn't write this epistle. And this is not, he's not the author of it, not the human author. Um, there are some scholars that are not content to let a book just say who wrote it. I mean, what does it say in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1? Peter. That's who wrote it. But some people are just not content to accept that. They've got to, well, you know, it says Peter, but um, I, I bet somebody in the early church put this out and, and attached Peter's name to it to get it some credibility, and so let's find out who really wrote this. And so they say, based on 1 Peter 5, 1, look, this couldn't have been Peter because he wasn't an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ because he forsook him, as did all the others. John was in there for a time, right? So I don't know if they're trying to imply that John wrote it, but that holds absolutely no water, no weight whatsoever. But uh, what about that? Peter not being eyewitness to the sufferings of Christ. Uh, I would submit to you, number one, he was in the garden with Jesus. One of three apostles who went on further into Gethsemane. You think Jesus didn't suffer that night in Gethsemane? Now they fell asleep, but they witnessed some intense suffering of the Savior there in the garden of Gethsemane. Number two, and again, I'm not trying to get too far off into speculation, and I'll tell you this is, this is speculation, but I sometimes wonder about that, that phrase, eyewitnesses. Can you imagine as he denies Jesus the third time, as the cock crows, and he locks eyes with Jesus? The pain and the hurt that must have been in the eyes of his Savior. And tell me that man hasn't seen, hasn't been an eyewitness to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And of course, he would have, no doubt followed afar off to see what would happen, as many did, and would have seen Jesus crucified, may have even seen the scourging take place. So that doesn't hold water. But if nothing else, I just think about that moment when he denied Jesus the third time and his eyes met the Savior's eyes. That had to be quite painful. Of course, John 13, Peter says to Jesus, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And of course, Peter's response is, well, not, not just my feet, my head, and my whole body. 
So, again, Peter's speaking out. John chapter 18 in the garden, he's going to defend Jesus. This before he forsakes Jesus, of course. And he does what? He, he, he's got his sword and he cuts off Malchus's ear. He wasn't going for the ear, folks. He was, he was ready to fight. I've, I've heard Brother Cates gave us a sermon outline. I've never developed it and preached it, or a sermon title, I guess. But uh, it was called Willing to Die But Not Willing to Live. You know, some folks are willing to die for the Lord, but don't ask them to live day to day, faithful day by day. And, you know, it's kind of like the woman who says to her husband, you know, you'd die for me, right? And he said, absolutely, in a heartbeat, I'd give my life for you. And she says, well, while you're waiting to die, could you help with the dishes? <laughs> you know, sometimes people are willing to die for the Lord, say, oh, I'd give my life for being a Christian. But are you living daily for the Lord? John chapter 21 Brother Scott mentioned about being a fisherman and being strong. Uh, you know, in John chapter 21, John tells Peter and the other apostles there, he says, Jesus is on the shore, remember, and he tells them, cast your nets on the other side. And they can't even bring up all these fish. And John says what? It is, it is the Lord. And what does Peter do? They, they say, okay, let's row to shore. But what does Peter say? Well, he didn't say anything. He jumps in, right? It's about 100 yards to the, uh, to the shore. So that's not just a little bitty swim. So here, you know, here's a guy, that he just jumps in and swims right over to the shore, and they come along later. Uh, Acts chapter 10, you have Peter arguing with God. The great sheet that's let down from heaven arise, Peter kill and eat. Peter says, oh no, God, not me. I'm, I'm a good Jew, and I don't eat anything common or unclean. And what does the voice say? You know, you can kind of understand Peter's response that first time, but then the voice says, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common. And, and so then the second time, right, Peter's going to, hey, rise Peter, kill and eat. Oh, no, not me. But, you know, again, before we're too quick to criticize Peter, have we ever done that? You ever resisted God? I, I dare say if any of us were to say no, we're lying. We're lying to ourselves or to one another or something, maybe both. Because we all have at some point argued with God, maybe tried to reason something away, rationalize it, justify it. Peter, Peter was subject to that too. And of course, Galatians 2, I mentioned earlier, with his prejudice. But when Jesus was risen from the dead and the angel spoke in Mark chapter 16, what did he say? Go tell his disciples and Peter. Isn't that interesting? Why did the angel call Peter by name? Jesus says, I got a special message for Peter. Now, don't you know that meant something to that man? I can't even begin to imagine how low he must have been after denying Jesus three times, remembering what Jesus said, meeting eyes with Jesus, seeing the pain in his eyes, and then seeing him suffer and die, and feeling like I just stood there and let it happen. I denied that I even knew the man. And then as he's resurrected, somebody comes and says, Jesus has sent a message for you, Peter. You, you know that had to mean something. And then, of course, in John 21, when he gets to the shore, Jesus says, and a lot of folks say, and again, I guess it's kind of speculation, there seems to be something to it, though, three different times, maybe to correspond with three different denials, that Jesus says, Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. What's the instruction? Feed my sheep. That's 1 Peter. All the basic Christian doctrines covered in 1 Peter. He's encouraging people to faithful living. He's, he's doing what, what God told him to do. The writer is Peter, as I mentioned. Uh, tradition tells us, again, we don't have inspiration on this, but tradition tells us Peter was martyred around 75 years of age. And according to early church tradition, he was martyred by crucifixion. He was ordered to be crucified, and of course the Romans had perfected that method of torture and death. And he was ordered to be crucified, and does anybody know maybe from your study of church history what his request was, at least as history tells us? To be crucified upside down. Why? Why, don't, why would anyone request that? He felt like he was unworthy to die as his Lord had died. And so his request was, will you crucify me upside down? 
amazing the transformation this man underwent from Peter the brash, outspoken, sometimes far too impetuous disciple to Peter, great leader, great speaker, faithful, stalwart apostle of Jesus Christ to the very end. I spent too much time talking about Peter, but I think all that comes into, come into, comes into play, especially some of that background we're going to need when we get into the actual text because you're going to see some of this. And uh, James Burton Kaufman in his commentary even has a great parallel of some things that are in 1 Peter to things that are in Jesus' teachings and showing how it is so obvious that the writer of this epistle was a man who was intimately close with the Son of God. Uh, I'm probably just going to hand that out as a list because it's, there's so many of those that it would take a lot of time to cover them in class. We'll just kind of hit them as we come through them. But uh, we'll, we'll talk just a little bit more next week about the author as being Peter and look at a couple of arguments that people sometimes make against Peter as the author. We'll talk about the date. That's important when you look at this book. And then look at the main purpose. I think most of us understand probably the main purpose of 1 Peter is to encourage people who are about to go through a serious persecution. But we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, Lord willing, next week. Thank you. Appreciate your attention. I'm looking forward to studying this great book with you.